You know, the Lord reminded me of a, a sermon that I heard 30 years ago, and uh, I was in Oklahoma. The preacher said something that was astounding to me, and I don't remember really his message, but I'll never forget one thing that he said as he was talking about the Spirit to the world. The world looks at Jesus and looks at the cross, and many are offended. But often, Christians, religious people, look at the Spirit, and they are offended. And they think, I don't need that Holy Spirit. I don't want that. You know, when Jesus had just less than a day with his disciples left before he went to the cross, he spent a considerable amount of time preparing them and teaching them about the Holy Spirit that would come. When he told them that he was leaving, they really got upset. I mean, Peter said, Lord, you can't do that. Why can't I go where you're going? What do you mean? The other disciples were really very incredibly sad and sorrowful, the Bible says. They didn't understand because, I mean, they really had a good thing going with Jesus. They'd been with him for over three years. Every day they watched him do the miraculous he provided for every need they had. There was adventure around every corner, excitement, and the love of God ministered to them. His peace was tangible. And they didn't understand why he had to do this. But he let them know, I'm going to go. But don't be afraid, because I'm going to send someone to you. And I want to read this verse we're going to actually start in chapter 16 of John, verse 7. He says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient, the King James says, or it's advantageous for you that I go away. It's better for you that I leave. And that was mind-blowing to them. For if I don't go away, then the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And if you go back to chapter 14, chapter 14, 15, 16, he's teaching them about the Holy Spirit. You know, 1 Peter calls the Holy Spirit the Spirit of Christ. The Spirit of Christ. Paul uses that term too. The Spirit of Christ. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. In chapter 14 of John, he says in verse 16, and I will pray or ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter. Another. In the Greek, that word another means just the same as me, that he may live with you or abide in you forever. It was advantageous for him to go for them. It would be disadvantageous for him to stay because the one who was coming was his spirit to live in them. You know, David prayed, Lord, don't take your spirit from me. We never have to pray that. He will never leave you. He's in you. He dwells within us. That's closer than Jesus next to them. And forever. And, you know, how we see the spirit uh, shouldn't be a judgment based on people. Because the Holy Spirit's not weird. People are weird. But he's not. Weird. We should never think someone under the influence of the Spirit is how we judge the Spirit. We look at Jesus, if you want to know who the Holy Spirit is, what He's like, what He cares about, what, how He operates, look at Jesus Christ. Jesus was never weird. People loved Him. People came for miles because they just heard He was coming through the town. There were thousands of people that would rush him at a time just to get a glimpse of him, just to hear him speak one word. That's the Spirit in you today. Jesus said, I'm going to send another like me, just like myself, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another Savior. The Passion Translation goes into great detail about why they chose that word instead of comforter. Because Jesus is our Savior, but he sent another like himself to operate the work of salvation in your life. He is Christ in us, so he certainly is our Savior. 
Amen? The Holy Spirit of truth who will be to you a friend, just like me. And he will never leave you. The world won't receive him because they can't see him or know him, but you know him intimately. He said this to the disciples. You know him intimately. Why? Because they knew Jesus intimately. Because he remains with you and will live inside you. If, the, if believers don't see the importance of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, they miss out on everything God wants to do in their life or could do, has promised to do. Jesus said it's by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that you get born again. So the same people that don't want the Holy Spirit in their life had to have the Holy Spirit to get born again. But there's a lot of misunderstanding about the Spirit. And I don't mean you. I'm talking about out there. There's a lot of religious teaching. There's a lot of fallacies and misrepresentation of his nature and his character. But I want to show you something here in, in Acts. Remember, uh, on the day of Pentecost, when the Spirit fell, and they were all filled with the Spirit, they were in Jerusalem. These were Jews. These 120 in the upper room were all of the Jewish faith. They had been. They received Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but it wasn't till the day of Pentecost that the Spirit was poured out. But here in chapter 10, Peter has been up on the roof waiting for lunch. A lot of times they'd cook downstairs and the house would fill with smoke so the guys would go upstairs and wait on the roof. And, but he, was, he, he fell into a trance. And remember the Lord showed him the sheet came down out of heaven and it was full of unclean, quote, unquote, unclean animals. And the, the Lord said, rise up and eat this. And he's like, no way, it's unclean. What was God showing him? God was showing him what God's heart was towards the world. Regardless whether you were Jew or non-Jew, Jesus was given for you. His life was your purchase for salvation. He, was, he is a redeemer for the Gentile and the Jew. And as so far, the Holy Spirit had not fa fallen on the Gentiles. But after this happened, immediately then somebody came to the door and said, we're looking for Peter. The Lord had come to Cornelius and said, go get Peter and he's going to preach the truth to you. And here in chapter 10, oh, we're going to start at verse 42. So this is Peter preaching to a house of Gentiles, non-Jewish, although Cornelius more, more than likely had converted to Judaism. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of the living and the dead. To him give all the prophets witness. Old Testament bears witness to the one coming, Jesus Christ. Amen. That through his name, whosoever believes in him shall receive cleansing and remission of sins. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. So this was the Gentile Pentecost. Now, but if you look at the Greek word for fell, it's epipipto. That Greek word means to embrace. The Holy Spirit embraced them as he fell on them. See, that I can see Jesus embracing people, but the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. Remember when the prodigal son came home finally to his father, and Jesus taught this parable, this story. The father represents your father in heaven, and he saw the son at a far distant, and remember, he, he was a mess. He was stunk like the pigs. He squandered his father's inheritance. But his father came running to the son. And what's the Bible say? And he fell on his neck. That's what it says in the book of Luke. That's the same Greek word. He embraced his son. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, will hug you and embrace you. What do you need? I think sometimes we just need a good hug. 
Epipipto. That's a cool word. Let's go, um, go back to John. John 16. We need to do what Jesus did with the disciples. We need to learn about the Holy Spirit and to look at him the way Jesus taught us. He would act how he would, he would benefit us. Amen. But when the truth-giving spirit comes, he will unveil the reality of every truth within you. He won't speak on his own, but only what he hears from the Father. And he will reveal prophetically to you what is to come. Amen. Verse 14. He will glorify me on the earth, for he will receive from me what is mine and reveal it to you. He will receive what is mine and give it to you, show it to you. We need the Holy Spirit every day. We need him to reveal what belongs to Jesus, what Jesus has done for us, what he has given us with an understanding that we can operate in that, we can walk in that, and we can have faith to receive those things. When Jesus says, what's mine? What does Jesus own? What is his? What? The Bible says he's been given everything the Father had, the full inheritance. And because he's in us, it isn't that he has to, has to find something to give us. That inheritance has been given, but we don't see it. We don't know it. It takes the Holy Spirit to prove and to refute the lie that you're not worthy. You're not good enough. You don't know enough. You have weak faith. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. And we can trust him. He's trustworthy, isn't he? Everything that belongs to the Father belongs to me, Jesus says. That's why I say that the divine encourager, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not a name. Some people call the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, like you would call me Marcy. That's not his name. Amen. There's only one name that you need to know. And that's really, the Lord showed me this. When Jesus is talking about prayer, and he's talking about the Holy Spirit coming to the disciples, and he's teaching them to pray to the Father, in his name. And we understand that and we do that. We don't pray to the Holy Spirit. What he's teaching in that truth is that you as a son of God, Almighty God, you can you have a legal right and you have free access as a son and daughter to ask your father for whatever you have need of. So the authority of the name of Jesus grants you the highest Power, highest authority in heaven and earth in your prayer life. The best way to pray is as a child who has inherited everything. There's no higher authority. There's no higher name for us to pray in or to exercise than the name of Jesus Christ. That's why we pray. I've heard a lot of people pray to the Holy Spirit. And I don't think that that's wrong. But I'm telling you, you want to pray with the highest authority. Use the name of Jesus and ask your Father who's in heaven, who sent his Spirit to embrace you. Amen. Jump back up to verse 8. Let's go back there. Verse 8. So Jesus is still teaching about the Holy Spirit. He's assuring the disciples, everything is going to just be just as good, if not better, because I'm going. And when he has come, he will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. Honestly, I grew up most of my life in the church thinking that the Holy Spirit was mad at me all the time. I was a failure spiritually. We used to say, we used to say, well, you know, Holy Spirit's really convicting me. And that's where this word reproof comes from. But Jesus didn't say that. But go to the next verse. So Jesus is, is he's expounding now about what he just said, that the Holy Spirit would reprove the world of sin. Who is the world? Who's he talking about when he says the world? Unbelievers, those who haven't received Christ. So then he goes on to say, of sin, because the world doesn't accept me, doesn't believe me. So the Holy Spirit convicts of one sin. Not receiving Jesus, not believing Jesus, unbelief. That's it. The Holy Spirit is not a nag. Remember when Jesus, when they brought the woman who, who was caught in the act of adultery and they threw this woman at him, and what did he say? You were bad. No, he didn't say that. He said, 
were your accusers. Neither do I condemn you. The nation that you and I sense is not from the Holy Spirit. He doesn't condemn. If Jesus doesn't condemn, would the Holy Spirit condemn? There's perfect agreement, amen, between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Perfect agreement. The Bible says in, um, I think it's 1 Corinthians. Yeah, Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 56. The sting of death is sin, and the strength or the power of sin is the law. It's you and I being reminded that we have broken God's law that brings condemnation. It's the law that condemns. That's why you can go to church and just feel horrible when you leave because people are still preaching the law. That's not the gospel. Yes, we know it's wrong to steal. The law tells us that. But even if we're a thief, the Holy Spirit wants to embrace you. That's amazing. Now, the word reprove the word in the King James says the Holy Spirit will reprove the world of sin. That means convict, confute, and convince. And I had to look the word confute up. It means to prove to be false, to disprove. So this is the passion. This is really good. And when he comes, he will expose sin and prove that the world is wrong about God's righteousness and his judgments. Sin because they refuse to believe in who I am. God's righteousness, because I'm going back to join the Father and you'll see me no longer. And judgment, because the ruler of this dark world has already received his sentence. Okay, so there's three individuals there that really represent those three works of the Spirit. Sin came on the world through Adam. The Holy Spirit confutes or convinces the world that they are sinners, but that they need Jesus. Adam. Secondly, Christ, Jesus, is the righteousness of God. And when he said, I'm going to the Father, the message of righteousness has to be taught. It has to be preached. We have to be convinced if we are in Christ, we are as good as Christ in God's eyes. We are righteous. He says he's sending the Spirit to convince you that you are still right even though you just sinned. There's not a lot of preachers who are willing to say that. But God said, as far as the east is from the west, so if I remove your transgressions from you. That doesn't give us a license to sin. This is the... This is the the mistake that a lot of people think, well, grace just gives you a license to sin. No, grace gives you a desire to live righteous because you so appreciate the work on the cross and the one who gave his righteousness to you, though we are all unworthy. He doesn't take it away when we sin. It's not this back and forth, give it back. Okay, you can have it again. Because it's not based on our work our worth, our performance. It's all about the cross and the judgment. So Adam, Jesus, and Satan. That's the judgment the Holy Spirit is preaching to us today. The devil is under your feet. It was all done. Yeah, he raises his head and smoke screams and yells and screams and tries to fling his fiery darts at you. But as far as the Holy Spirit God and Jesus see it, he's toast. Amen. And that takes some convincing when your body hurts. But that's the work of the Spirit. Jesus called him our helper. Let him help. Ask him to help. Ask his presence to come when you need something. I want to go over this last little bit here. I want to go. The Bible is written in three languages. Hebrew in the Old Testament. Greek in the New Testament, and Aramaic in both. And Aramaic in both. I am not a linguist, so don't I am not a linguist, so don't expect much here. It's the language the disciples spoke. And it's a it's the language the disciples spoke. And it's a it speaks to the heart more than Greek. It speaks to the heart more than Greek. It speaks to the mind. 
Now, Jesus, he, of course, was raised speaking Aramaic. He learned Hebrew from his mother. He learned he, the word, the Old Testament. And he probably spoke Greek because, and he probably spoke Greek because of the influence. I'm going to give you the Aramaic trans, I'm going to give you the, of the comforter. And you're not going to find this in your Strong's Concordance because, and you're not going to find this in your Strong's Concordance because the Strong's, there are documents, there are not just the Dead Sea Scrolls that, that are Aramaic in their origin and that are Aramaic lead this interpretation or translation of the Comforter. Interpret. Remember when Jesus on the, was on the cross? Remember when Jesus on the, was on the cross and he said, Eli, Eli, or when he said to Peter's, or to the, to the maid, Talitha Kumi, or to the, to the maid, Talitha Kumi. That's Aramaic. You'll see the Aramaic throughout. The Holy Spirit in Greek is parakletos, and it's really could be translated your defense. And it's in the Aramaic, it's made up of two words. In the, in Aramaic, Holy Spirit is parakleta. In, and it's from two different words, prak and, it, and lita. Okay? So, and lita. To end, to finish, or to save. Lita means curse. Is one that ends the curse. Is one that he reverses the curse. How does he do it? He reverses the curse. How does he do it? He reveals to you, Jesus said, what is mine. He shows it to you, and you get by the power, the transforming power of the anointing, the Holy Spirit convinces you I've been delivered from the curse, Heracleta, the Redeemer who ends the curse. We serve one God, and he manifests himself different ways to us. But thank the Lord that he abides within us and his spirit teaching that he abides within us and his spirit teaching us and helping us to grab hold of the deliverance. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. I wrote these eight things down. The work of the Holy Spirit. You could say the, the work of the Holy Spirit. You could say the, the modern day ministry of the Holy Spirit in the world convicts the world, gives new life. The born again experience will not happen. The born again experience will not happen without the work of gives us power to, gives us pa Acts 1 8. You'll be my witnesses when the Acts 1 8. You'll be my witnesses when the power of the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You'll be my Witnesses, power to serve. The Holy Spirit confirms and assures. I mean, I used to let the devil beat me up when I was a kid. I mean, I used to let the devil beat me up when I was a kid all the time. You're not. But the Holy Spirit works. On, but the Holy Spirit works on your behalf to convince you. in Jesus Christ. Assures us of salvation. And he assures us, assures us of salvation. And he assures us of salvation. He points to and reveals the truth. He, you know, this is so important in this world. There's so much, you know, this is so important in this world. There's so much deception. So many lies. I just, some swallow. It just amazes me. The Holy Spirit will teach you. The Holy Spirit, look to Him. Don't believe everything you look to Him. Don't believe everything you read on the internet. I'm serious. The Lord can tell me, you need to focus on the Word. The world's distractions will get you nothing. The world's distractions will get you nothing in unbelief. But the Holy Spirit will reveal truth. He helps us overcome. I, I mean, I think that's why we need to go to church. Because all week long, we're just getting beat up, beat up, beat up, beat up, beat up. We need to be reminded of what we already know, but the Holy Spirit will make it alive in you. He's our teacher teaches us and he reminds us. This is why Peter said, I want to remind you of this. You already know this, but we need to be reminded. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit. He's our teacher. He knows everything. He knows the mind of God. He makes intercession for us. Romans 8 says, I'm so thankful for the Spirit. I was in a, in a meeting. I don't know. Some of you know who Nora, Nora Lamb was. She was a Chinese woman who was arrested by the communist Chinese and put in a concentration camp like situation. Um, she has a, she, she's dead now, but she had tremendous testimony and I somehow got hooked up with her and I went on a mission trip with her. Maybe this is where that happened, but 
um, she was preaching, and she was just this little tiny thing, and um, she said, she was preaching about the Holy Ghost, and she'd say it like that, the Holy Ghost, she goes, and she had a real thick Chinese accent, and she said, my kids don't want me to call the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost, but I like to call him the Holy Ghost. The reason was is because she wasn't offended by that, and the power of the Holy Ghost was real to her. We're not offended by the Holy Ghost in this church or the Holy Spirit. We, we don't try to be politically correct when it comes to the power of God.